Good afternoon and thank you for joining the daily briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, all speakers are joining the briefing virtually to adhere to social distancing guidelines. We will now begin our briefing with opening remarks from Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you now have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the Department of Prisons will begin testing of all incarcerated individuals, including those who are asymptomatic. This testing will begin tomorrow. It is possible now for a couple of reasons. First, as you know, the Department of Health recently expanded testing criteria for congregate settings. Also, the city now has access to more testing supplies. This effort includes testing all asymptomatic people currently incarcerated and newly admitted people entering the Philadelphia Department of Prison facilities before testing was only available to those experiencing symptoms. Expanded testing will also include people who are pending transfer to a different correctional facility. These individuals will be tested for COVID-19 coronavirus three to five days before their transfer. Of course, we will continue to test symptomatic individuals as part of previously established protocols. Isolation space will continue to be provided to all people who test positive within the Department of Prisons facilities. I wanna point out that since the start of the pandemic, the Department of Prisons has closely followed CDC recommendations to contain the spread of the coronavirus in the facilities. In early April, there were 10 or more prisoners testing positive each day, but in the past 10 days, only two inmates have tested positive. So it is clear that those efforts are succeeding. Also tomorrow, the Department of Human Services will begin testing of all youth at the Juvenile Justice Services Center. This facility-wide testing is part of our continued effort to ensure the health of all youth who are held there. Since the outset of the, of the epidemic, PJJSC has worked with advocates and partners to move as many youth as possible to other community-based services or to other appropriate placements. I'm pleased both of these testing operations are moving forward. Prisons Commissioner Blanche Carney and DHS Commissioner Kimberly Ali have joined us today in, the, in case there are further questions. Finally, I wanted to make a note that this is National EMS Week. Paramedics and emergency medical technicians deserve this appreciation every week, but never more so than right now. The EMS division of the Philadelphia Fire Department is always there for residents. In 2019, the Philadelphia Fire Department operated 50 ambulances, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, plus 10 more during peak times. Our EMS providers respond to about 750 incidents each day from car accidents and cardiac arrests to shooting strokes and yes, also the su to suspected COVID-19 cases. This morning, I had the opportunity to visit Engine 43 at 21st of Market Streets and to personally thank members of Engine 43, Ladder 9 and Medic 7 who are based there. Like all members of, of the department, their dedication and their willingness to put themselves on the front line in this difficult time deserves recognition and our thanks. So this week and every week, when you see a PFD ambulance or engine or ladder, stop and wave and give a shout of thanks because they risk their, they're risking their lives to save lives. Finally, today we are hitting an unfortunate milestone. The city as of today has exceeded 20,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. So even though the number of cases per day is far better than one month ago, this new total is a grim reminder that many Philadelphians are still testing positive and all of us are still at risk. So stay home, stay safe, and wear a face covering when you go outside, please. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Farley for his update. Thank you very much, Mayor. We are continuing to make good progress uh, against the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, the numbers actually, despite the 20,000 threshold recovering, the numbers are quite encouraging. Since this time yesterday, we've con confirmed 179 new cases, bringing us to a total of 20,132 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, a month ago, we were reporting about 500 new cases a day. Now we're reporting about 200 cases a day is quite a decline since the peak of the epidemic. We're making progress in congregate settings of all sorts. Um, a month ago in our nursing homes, we were getting about 50 to 100 cases per day across the entire city. Now we're getting fewer than 10 cases per day in nursing homes. If you wanna see that better, look at the graph on our website. And as the mayor said, uh, zero new cases in the city's jail since yesterday. Currently, there are three inmates who are testing positive uh, in the facility. Now, with the facility-wide screening that the mayor has just announced, we do expect that we will find more cases. We don't know how many there are, but we expect that number will go up with that screening. Likewise, with more screening taking place in nursing homes, we may pick up cases we're not currently diagnosing. 
Uh, the data from hospitals uh, is being the reporting that has changed a little bit. Rather than reporting the patients who were in the hospital this morning, I have now data from yesterday afternoon. In the fu future, I'll be reporting the hospital numbers from the afternoon before. As of yesterday afternoon, there were 619 uh, inpatients with coronavirus infection in Philadelphia hospitals, 1,224 in hospitals in, throughout the region. That is still a, a pretty marked decline from where we were at the peak just at the end of April. Since this time yesterday, we've confirmed nine new deaths from the coronavirus infection, bringing us to a total of 1,049 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, about a month ago, we were reporting about 30 deaths per day. Now that we're in the single digits, that's really a, clearly a marked uh, decline. Of that total, 567 or 54% were nursing home uh, residents. Testing is now available at 47 different sites across the city of Philadelphia and more sites uh, in the suburbs. Uh, just go to our website, www.phila.gov testing. To remind people that's where we have a great map. You can see all the testing sites across the city. You can click on any dot in the map and uh, find out where that site is, what phone number you need to call to make an appointment. We're encouraging anyone at any age with new onset of respiratory symptoms to go in and get tested. It's free of charge. There's plenty of places to get it done. It's easy to get it done. If you have those symptoms, come on in. As the case counts go down, it becomes even more important for us to diagnose people we previously might've been missing. Now, as far as everyone else who doesn't have symptoms, we frequently get questions at these press conferences about people who are not following our social distancing recommendations. But I wanna emphasize that most people in Philadelphia are following our recommendations. And the success we're seeing as far as the case counts going down every day is a sign that it's working. People in Philadelphia are clearly being responsible. It shows that we can change how we behave every day. As we approach the next phase in this, the yellow phase, we're gonna to have to go through another change in our behavior. Right now we've been taught how to stay inside. And we've learned how to stay inside. Uh, in the future, we're gonna be going outside, but wearing a mask. So it's not hard uh, to change our behavior to wearing a mask. In fact, it's probably easier than figure out how to stay inside all day, but that's what we're all gonna to have to do. So if you haven't already done it, get a mask, get used to wearing it because that's what the future is gonna look like. Uh, so all the information about our uh, outbreak is available at www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Farley. We are now gonna go to Armando who will deliver the Spanish language translation on both the mayor and Dr. Farley's remarks. Mensaje del alcalde Jim Kenny para el martes 19 de mayo del 2020. Buenas tardes a todos. Hoy me complace anunciar que el Departamento de Prisiones comenzará a evaluar a todas las personas que se encuentran encarceladas, incluyendo aquellas que no presentan síntomas. Esas pruebas masivas comenzarán mañana. Y esto se hace posible en este momento por varias razones. Primero, como ya se sabe, el Departamento de Salud recientemente amplió los criterios de prueba para los ambientes congregados. Además, la ciudad tiene ahora más acceso a estas pruebas. Este proyecto incluye evaluar a todas las personas encarceladas y recién ingresadas en las prisiones de Filadelfia que no presentan síntomas actualmente. Anteriormente, las pruebas solo estaban disponibles para aquellos que sí los tenían. Las pruebas ampliadas también incluirán a las personas que van a ser transferidas a otro centro correccional. Estas personas serán evaluadas para detectar el coronavirus de tres a cinco días antes de ser transportadas. Y por supuesto, continuaremos realizando pruebas a los individuos sintomáticos como parte de los protocolos previamente establecidos. Se continuará brindando espacios de aislamiento a todas las personas que den positivo en las instalaciones del Departamento de Prisiones. Quiero señalar que desde el comienzo de esta pandemia, el Departamento de Prisiones ha seguido de cerca las recomendaciones de los Centros de Control de Enfermedades para contener la propagación del coronavirus en sus instalaciones y los esfuerzos han sido exitosos. A principios de abril, estábamos reportando diariamente 10 o más casos positivos en las prisiones, pero en los últimos 10 días, solo dos reclusos han dado positivo a la prueba. También mañana, el Departamento de Servicios Humanos comenzará a evaluar a todos los jóvenes recluidos en el Centro de Servicios de Justicia Juvenil, o PJJSC. Suministrar estas pruebas en las instalaciones es parte de nuestros esfuerzos continuos para garantizar la salud de todos los jóvenes epidemia, el PJJSC ha trabajado con los defensores y con sus aliados para trasladar a la mayor cantidad posible de jóvenes a otras instalaciones más apropiadas. Me complace que estas dos operaciones 
de la administración de la prueba estén avanzando. La comisionada de prisiones, Blanche Carney, y la comisionada del Departamento de Servicios Humanos, Kimberly Alley, nos acompañan el día de hoy para responder a sus preguntas sobre este tema. Finalmente, quería señalar que esta es la Semana Nacional de los Servicios Médicos de Emergencia, o EMS. Los paramédicos y los técnicos de emergencias merecen este reconocimiento diariamente, pero reconocerlos ahora se hace aún más necesario. La División MS del Departamento de Bomberos de Filadelfia siempre está presente para nuestros residentes. En el año 2019, el Departamento de Bomberos de Filadelfia operaba 50 ambulancias 24 horas al día, 7 días por semana, los 365 días al año, más 10 ambulancias adicionales durante las horas pico. Nuestro personal de EMS responde aproximadamente a 750 incidentes cada día, incluyendo accidentes automovilísticos, paros cardíacos, accidentes cerebrovasculares, hasta tiroteos, y sí, también casos sospechosos de la COVID-19. Esta mañana tuve la oportunidad de visitar la sede del Engine 43 en las calles 21 y Market y agradecerles personalmente a los miembros del Engine 43, Ladder 9, Medic 7, que funcionan también desde ahí. Al igual que todos los miembros del departamento, su dedicación y su disposición a ponerse en la primera línea de respuesta especialmente en estos momentos difíciles, merece un reconocimiento especial. Así que esta mañana y todas las semanas, cuando vea usted una ambulancia del Departamento de Bomberos de Filadelfia, salúdelos y agradezcales, porque ellos están arriesgando sus vidas para salvar las nuestras. Finalmente, el día de hoy, hemos alcanzado un nuevo hito desafortunado. Tristemente, la ciudad ha superado los 20,000 casos confirmados del COVID-19. Por tanto, a pesar que la cantidad de casos diarios es mucho menor que la que había hace un mes, esto es un triste recordatorio de que muchos habitantes de Filadelfia todavía están dando positivo al virus y que todos estamos aún bajo riesgo. Así que por favor, quédese en casa, manténgase a salvo y use una máscara cuando salga. Esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el martes 19 de mayo del año 2020. Desde ayer se han confirmado 179 nuevos casos del coronavirus en Filadelfia y actualmente tenemos un total de 20,132 casos en la ciudad. Hay una clara tendencia en la disminución de los casos y estamos viendo una clara mejora, pero lamentablemente también hemos sobrepasado los 20,000 casos. Sin embargo, hace un mes reportábamos 500 casos diarios y hoy reportamos menos de 200, así que estamos yendo en la dirección correcta. También se ven mejoras en la evolución de los casos en los entornos grupales. No tenemos nuevos casos del COVID-19 en las cárceles y actualmente tenemos solamente tres casos confirmados. Esperamos encontrar más casos en las cárceles con la implementación de las pruebas masivas. También reportamos que en los hogares de ancianos, donde habían entre 50 a 100 casos diarios, hoy podemos decir que se registran menos de 10 casos diariamente. Y también reportamos, tristemente, nueve muertes por la COVID-19 en la ciudad. Hay un total de 1,049 personas que han muerto por la COVID-19. Hace un mes estábamos reportando alrededor de 30 muertes diarias y hoy reportamos números individuales. 567 o el 54% de estas muertes han sido en hogares de ancianos. Recordamos de que este virus no discrimina por raza o por género. E informamos que hasta ayer en la tarde, 619 personas han sido hospitalizadas en Filadelfia y 1,224 personas en la región sureste de Pensilvania. Estas cifras nos muestran un claro descenso en las admisiones a los hospitales. Las pruebas siguen disponibles en 47 centros de prueba ubicados a lo largo y ancho de la ciudad de Filadelfia. Usted puede ubicar el centro más cercano a su domicilio en fela.gov barra diagonal testing. En el pasado teníamos un acceso limitado a las pruebas debido a su poca disponibilidad pero ahora alentamos a todas las personas de cualquier edad que tengan fiebre o problemas respiratorios a realizarse la prueba del COVID-19. Las pruebas están disponibles con previa cita. Frecuentemente estamos recibiendo preguntas sobre personas que no siguen las recomendaciones. Sin embargo, también reportamos que muchos sí las están observando. El éxito en la contención del virus demuestra que Filadelfia es una ciudad responsable. Nosotros podemos cambiar cómo nos portamos diariamente. A medida que nos acercamos a la fase amarilla, vamos a tener que cambiar de nuevo nuestras costumbres. Vamos a poder salir nuevamente, pero debemos utilizar una máscara al salir. No es difícil, de hecho, puede ser más fácil que quedarse en casa. Consiga usted una marca, máscara o cubierta facial 
y acostúmbrese a usarla. Hay que recordar que mi máscara te protege a ti y tu máscara me protege a mí, porque juntos podemos superar este gran reto. Gracias. Great, thank you so much, Armando. Um, we will now move to our Q&A portion for members of the media. I would like to ask all of our speakers to rejoin us with audio and video. And just a reminder, we do have Prisons Commissioner Blanche Carney and DHS Commissioner Kimberly Ali joining us today for Q&A on the expanded testing criteria. Uh, please remember, we do have limited time during these briefings, so only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions in the first round. Um, we are asking reporters to limit questions to three or fewer, and we will do a second uh, round if time permits. And for those logged in today, please use the raise your hand feature found under the participants list. We also ask that you use video to ask your questions if you are able, and please announce who your question is addressed to since we do have additional folks on for QA today. We will now begin um, unmuting reporters one by one to ask your questions, and we'll start with Daryl C. Murphy of WHYY. Daryl? Uh, hello, uh, this question is for uh, Mayor Kenny. I was wondering um, with, I guess it's part of a way to recover from COVID and maybe like a long-term uh, revenue strategy. Um, are you considering uh, congestion pricing as a way to increase revenue for the city? That has not been an issue that's been raised in our conversations. Um, no, we can, we, can, we can look at it, but it has not come up to date. Got it, thank you. Okay, thanks, Daryl. Um, next, we're going to go to um, Shaira Arias with NBC 10 Telemundo. Shaira? Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so mi primera pregunta, Armando, es para el doctor Farley. Armando, ¿me escuchas? Por supuesto. Claro que sí, Shaira. Aquí está. Okay. Perfecto. Eh, ¿Cuál es el mensaje para los residentes de Filadelfia en cuanto al hecho de que no, él les sugiere que no vayan a la playa? Este para el Memorial Day Weekend y ahora que están abiertos, eh, ¿por qué? ¿Cuál es el mensaje para ellos y por qué no deberían de ir a la playa? This first question is for Dr. Farley. You've made out the message, put out the message that Philadelphia residents should not be going to the beach, especially this Memorial Day now that the beaches are open. My question is why and what is your message to them? Well, you know, being outside is probably somewhat lower risk than being inside. Uh, on the other hand, Memorial Day weekend at the beach uh, with a bunch of people on the boardwalk not wearing masks could be an awful lot of people together. And so that's a fairly high risk that at least one person has the infection can pass it on to others. So at this stage of the epidemic, when we're getting 200 cases per day, uh, it's just too risky for people to be getting in those sorts of crowds. Probablemente el estar afuera es más seguro que el estar dentro, pero obviamente el estar en la playa, estar en el paseo tablado, en el boardwalk, Va a haber mucha gente que no esté utilizando mascarillas, va a estar congregado en grupos y basta con que una sola persona esté infectada para que pueda transmitir esta infección a más de 200 personas. Por lo tanto, el mensaje es igual, que traten de no estar congregados en grupos, utilizar mascarillas y ejercer la distancia social en lo que sea posible. La próxima pregunta sería para el alcalde Jim Kenny. El hecho de que durante el fin de semana subieron las temperaturas, estaba mucho más agradable, Residentes dicen que están viendo a las personas eh, aglomeradas en los parques, llevando a cabo diferentes actividades. Yo misma lo he visto también. Entonces, ahora mientras, ¿cuál es la, o sea, la orden actual? Es de que las personas no pueden tener, por ejemplo, un barbecue, eh, picnics en los parques, no pueden jugar eh, deportes en grupo. ¿Cuál es el mensaje de él para aquellas personas que tal vez no están llevando a cabo esta orden exactamente al pie de la letra? ¿Y cuál es el plan de la ciudad a medida que nos estamos aproximando a que las temperaturas van a estar mucho más favorables y las personas van a querer estar afuera? Entonces, es, estaba más fácil cuando estaba la temperatura eh, un poco, o sea, hacía más frío, no todo el mundo quería salir, pero ahora va a ser más calor. Planean, tienen una, una estrategia que van a llevar a cabo. Un ejemplo, en Nueva York ya están poniendo como que donde una persona se puede sentar en los parques y donde una, otra persona no se puede sentar. Entonces, si tienen un plan para moverse hacia lo que es el verano. Como no, gracias, Shaira. Uh, this question is for the mayor, and the question has to deal with the fact that now over the weekend, as the temperatures are rising and the weather is fine, people are gathering up in parks and congregating. 
And I saw myself some people that are doing that and playing group sports. What are the current urges other than not having barbecues and people not being in parks? Because we see that a lot of people are not obeying the recommendations. Does the city have any plans as the temperatures rise? And of course, it was easier when the weather was colder. But now as the weather gets better, people are going to want to go out and congregate. Is there any strategy like the one that New York has in place for people that have to sit in separate spots in parks? Is there any plan ahead as the weather improves? We are working with the Park Department of Parks and Recreation uh, to develop um, some level of staff that will interact with folks in our in our parks and in our facilities and our playgrounds uh, to try to get people to understand that social distancing is important and that wearing a mask is the reason why we're at 200 cases a day as opposed to 500 cases a day. Um, we, the police have been more interactive. We're not obviously arresting anyone. Uh, they have the ability to issue citations uh, and they, we want to make sure we don't do this in a confrontational way, uh, but people have to understand uh, that it's their responsibility to get us to yellow, to get us to green and the resistance in doing that. Uh, and I will say the word selfish because I do believe there's an element of selfishness here. I also believe there's an effort, there's a, um, a portion of misunderstanding and misinformation is being provided by the White House and the president himself saying things that are just ridiculous and dangerous. Um, so it's given people, it's emboldened people to, it's somehow that if you don't wear a mask and you don't socially distance, you're somehow kind of a, a tough guy or a stronger person. You're not, we're all human beings, we're all susceptible to the virus uh, and we can die from it. Um, so I would ask for common sense, maturity, uh, and um, and just being a good person uh, to, to, to get this done. Uh, because if we don't do it, and we continue to, we have these flare ups in September, October, November, and we're back to five and 600 cases a day, we're gonna shut down again. And nobody wants to do that. Thank you. Estamos en coordinación con nuestro departamento de parques y recreación para que el personal actúe en los parques y le informe a la gente que tienen que observar las normas de distanciamiento social y utilizar las máscaras para no poder pasar de nuevamente de estar en 200 casos que se reportan a 500 o más. Tiene que ser un esfuerzo interactivo. No vamos a empezar a arrestar a las personas, aunque el personal tiene la capacidad de evitar, emitir multas y citaciones. Pero no podemos hacerlo de una forma confrontacional. Tenemos que contar con la responsabilidad de nuestros ciudadanos para poder pasar de la fase amarilla a la fase verde. Aquí detecto también un elemento de egoísmo un poco de falta de comprensión, de entendimiento y de mala información que se ha estado esparciendo, especialmente viniendo de la Casa Blanca, que hace declaraciones ridículas y peligrosas, como que es una señal de ser un tipo duro, el no utilizar la mascarilla y el resistir estas órdenes de distanciamiento social. Sin embargo, todos somos seres humanos, todos somos susceptibles al virus y hay que utilizar el buen sentido común para poder eh, evitar que en los meses de septiembre, octubre, pasemos nuevamente de 500 a 600 y más que casos así, de manera que tengamos que volver a cerrar la ciudad. Por último, Armando, ¿le puedes preguntar al alcalde para que las personas entiendan qué pueden hacer y qué no pueden hacer en los parques? Uh, this question, again, for the mayor. Uh, can you please tell the people what is it that they are able to do and what they shouldn't be doing in the parks? What they shouldn't be doing is playing group sports. They shouldn't be more than, uh, less than six feet apart. They should be wearing a mask. They should go out for exercise for an hour, hour, hour and a half, uh, and then go back home uh, and give some space to other people. Um, they sh shouldn't be barbecuing close to each other. Um, I mean, I, this is not, look, I understand human nature and I understand human nature. They want to be social. We're social creatures. This is a pandemic, as we, we all know. There's, you know, uh, almost 100,000 people in the country dead as a result of it. Um, you have to have self-control and you have to have maturity. Uh, and it's the only, I mean, look, we can't arrest, we're not going to, and we can't arrest everyone who's violating these norms or these protocols. Uh, but it's just, you, you shake your head when you see people just blatantly um, not doing the right thing. Uh, we're, hopefully we'll continue and see that wearing a mask and social distancing has got us to this point where we're close to kind of reopening up again. Uh, within within the next couple of few weeks, uh, if we continue with the trend this way. But if we don't and we go back, we're going to be back in the lockdown again. So it's up to individuals to just to be mature. Bueno, parece que nosotros tenemos el entendimiento de que 
no deben estar congregándose en grupos para hacer deportes grupales, tienen que mantener la distancia mínima de seis pies y utilizar sus mascarillas. Pueden hacer ejercicios de una hora, hora y media y luego dejarle el espacio a otras personas para que lo puedan hacer y evitar tratar de congregarse alrededor de barbacoas. Es interesante ver de que nosotros somos seres humanos y la naturaleza humana requiere del contacto social, pero también tenemos que ser responsables ante lo que es esencialmente una pandemia. Y no podemos pasar de lado el hecho de que en este país ha muerto ya casi un cuarto de millón de personas. Por lo tanto, tenemos que actuar con madurez, tenemos que actuar con generosidad, observar las normas y los protocolos que nos han permitido reducir la situación y poder pasar a un espacio mejor del cual estábamos. Porque si regresamos nuevamente a donde estábamos, vamos a tener que cerrar la ciudad. Estamos planificando abrir en unas dos semanas, pero si no se va a poder hacer, será porque la gente no lo esté tomando en serio. Por lo tanto, hay que apelar a su madurez, a su sentido común, a que se informen y que observen estas normas. Gracias. Thank you. Thanks, Shaira. We're going to go to Mitch Blocker of NBC10. Mitch? Good afternoon. Uh, I have a couple of questions for Dr. Farley. Um, with all the, this talk of opening up in a couple of weeks that uh, you, you've been discussing, I'm curious, what is the current 14-day average for cases in Philadelphia? And how close is Philadelphia for meeting the state-required guidelines to move into the first phase of reopening? Uh, well, you know, you said a couple of weeks. I didn't say a couple of weeks. I haven't put a timeline on it. Uh, I am saying that we are making a lot of progress. Um, I, I haven't looked at the exact rate um, lately. I think it's um, uh, somewhere around 200 per 100,000 and, and the governor's threshold is 50. Uh, and so that's a ways above that. On the other hand, we are dropping fairly rapidly. With more testing, obviously you, you expect to find more cases. I'm curious, how underestimated right now do you believe that that 20,000 positive case count is? Well, we know that many people have this infection and don't have any symptoms at all. And so uh, we would not have been testing those people in general. And other people have mild symptoms or, or earlier on uh, couldn't be tested at all. Uh, and so that 20,000 is clearly just a fraction of the total number of people who got the infection. I don't know whether it's a third or a fifth, uh, but It easily could be a fifth. It could be the 100,000 people or more in the city that actually had the infection. Uh, you have said that you would like to test at least 5,000 people a day in Philadelphia. I'm curious, how many are you testing a day? Uh, right now, it's a little bit more than 1,500 per day. And you have enough supplies, right, uh, to, to no. get to 5,000? Uh, why, why can't you? I don't think you we have be? enough supplies to get to 5,000 a day now. We definitely have enough supplies to, to increase from where we are now. I mean, each day we're getting a little more access. Uh, and, you know, it also depended on how many people come to our test sites. Uh, right now, our test sites are seeing maybe somewhat lower volume for each site. Uh, so um, we can definitely increase from here. Um, but, you know, there are sort of natural limits of how quickly we will increase. Is, is it a, it's not a supply issue. It's a demand issue. Uh, now it's a combination. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Mitch. Um, we are going to go to Jack Tomsick now with Metro. Yes, uh, this question is for the prison commissioner or for Dr. Farley. After all the inmates are tested, how regularly will they then be tested after this first round? So, um, prison commissioner, we're going to do the initial uh, round of uh, uh, one-time testing at this time. Okay, so there's no plans yet for, for doing a second round. That's cool. And this is for Dr. Farley. Uh, so now that, you know, all inmates are being tested, why? I know you're still not recommending testing for people who are asymptomatic. Why shouldn't people who are asymptomatic go in and get tested, especially if they think they've been uh, in, in, so, in somewhat close quarters with somebody who has the infection? Well, the uh, again, you can, you can test... Uh, negative today and test positive tomorrow. And I'm a little worried that some people will test and say, okay, that means I'm fine. I don't need to worry. And they'll get a false sense of security. Um, and, uh, you know, we practically speaking, we're not going to be able to test 1.5 million people every day. Again, if we can get up to 5,000 people per day, I'd be happy. Uh, there may be certain categories of people who don't have symptoms that we would recommend testing in the future. For example, people who really feel that they've been exposed to someone and it's been enough time to where they might be showing infection. But to just sort of to everyone, um, it doesn't really make sense to us right now. 
And are people in nursing homes being tested whether they're symptomatic or not? So that's changing. Um, up until now, nursing homes have tested people who are have symptoms or um, residents who might be close by, might have been exposed. Uh, but the state has now asked them to do facility-wide screening. Um, that's a major task given the number of nursing homes and the number of residents in nursing homes and the resources of those nursing homes. Uh, we support that recommendation, have facility-wide screening. I'm not quick, sure how quickly that's going to um, take place, uh, but I think that's a good idea. Uh, we've done it in a couple of facilities and found that it's valuable to identify people who otherwise might have been missed and to help a little more with the infection control practices around them. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. We're going to go to uh, Max Marin now of Billy Penn. Max. Hi, right, thanks, everybody. Uh, questions for Commissioner Carney about the testing. Um, when will the process begin? How long will it take? And how will the results be released? Testing will begin uh, campus-wide tomorrow, May 20th. It'll take us about two weeks to uh, test the entire population, and we anticipate uh, releasing the total number, uh, the results, the first week of June. Okay, and um, what is the population today in the prisons? Uh, 3,809. And uh, Mayor Kenny, you had said that this was largely an issue, uh, deciding the testing was largely an issue around the Department of Health's recommendations around testing. Could you I'm sorry, elaborate on that? You said that, uh, you said earlier that this was made possible because of the Department of Health's recommendations. What was made po possible? The, the, te the testing inside the city jails. I don't think I had a mention about the city jails. Doctor? Maybe I can help her. So that the, um, the health department did broaden its recommendation for testing uh, to say, uh, that was last week, that people in congregate settings uh, that we would recommend or that are consider recommending broader testing for people in congregate settings. Uh, and that, so that jail is definitely a definition of that. Uh, in the past, we have limited our testing in the jail to inmates who have symptoms. And you know, there's been a lot of work done to contain the infection around people with symptoms. But it's still a question about whether there's um, might be some spread beyond that. And so now that we have the availability of testing and we're thinking about broader testing in other congregate settings, we're including the jail in that. And I apologize, that was in my, my original comments. I thought you were asking me when I answered a question. So- <laughs> no, sorry, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's all. All right, thank you, Max. Denise Clay from the Philadelphia Sunday Sun is up next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a pre question for the prison commissioner and Dr. Farley, I think. When was the decision made to test the city's inmates? Um, we have been hearing around the country that jails and prisons were um, hotbeds for the coronavirus. So I guess, why did it take Philadelphia so much so long to come to a decision to where you would test the inmates? Uh, well, I, as um was said state previously by Dr. Farley, there was a challenge with um, uh, testing capacity. And at the time when we started testing folks, we were testing folks who were symptomatic. So we wanted to make sure that we were utilizing the available test kits wisely. Um, there were um, always opportunities for exploration, but at the onset, there was a challenge with the testing capability. And so that's why we decided to initially start with symptomatic folks versus testing the entire population from the onset. If I could add to that, uh, just to emphasize what the mayor said earlier, the efforts that the prison has made to contain the outbreak appear very much to be succeeding. Uh, so it was, I don't know, maybe a month ago that they were seeing 10 cases a day, whereas we've seen now maybe two cases in the past 10 days. So that the test is valuable. But what's more valuable are the steps they take to prevent spread of infection from one inmate to another or a staff member to an inmate. And those actions the prison has been taking and their work. Okay. Um, I had a question for the mayor. Um, I, I was reading in the papers this morning that, you know, folks are saying not to go to the Jersey Shore this weekend for Memorial Day weekend because it because of the whole, you know, are people going to actually practice social distancing on the beach? What are you hearing from the folks in New Jersey in response to that? Because part of the reason why they probably opened the beach was to try and, you know, 
it, it help with the economy at the shore. So what are you hearing from the folks in New Jersey? Has there been any blowback from that? No, I haven't heard anything from anyone in New Jersey at all. Well, that's it for me. Okay, thanks, Denise. We're gonna to go to Kennedy Rose now of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi, uh, I have a question for both the mayor and Dr. Farley. I was wondering what your thoughts were on New Jersey <clears throat> Governor Phil Murphy's plans for a stage reopening and whether those plans align with Philadelphia's values and goals for reopening. Doctor? You know, I confess I have not studied his plans. Uh, let me look at them and then get back to you. Okay. And uh, this is a question for both of you as well. Have you been coordinating with Governor Murphy's office in the same way that you've been coordinating with Governor Wolf's at all or no? I have not been, no. Okay, is there any particular reason for that or? Because um, we're dealing with our own governor and our own counties uh, and our own issues here in the city. And um, I mean, I, there's no reason why we why we wouldn't. It's just that there's a lot of, a lot of spinning plates in the air um, and we're trying to keep them from crashing. Uh, but we, we can have conversation with them. Uh, governor Murphy a, is a good person, good, a good, uh, very good governor. Um, I know there's pressure on, on uh, him and others from the southern part of New Jersey, well, actually the entire coast of New Jersey and the shore towns uh, to open up. So he's dealing with a different set of dynamics uh, and he's making decisions I, I believe that he thinks are right for his, for his state. Uh, no, I have no necessary complaint about him, um, but we just haven't had any conversation because we've been dealing with our region and, uh, and our state and our city. Yeah, and Kennedy, just to clarify, our Office of Emergency Management has been in contact with New Jersey's Office of Emergency Management, so there has been coordination and conversation. Uh, there just hasn't been at, the, at a political level, it's been at a purely operational level. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, Kennedy. We are gonna go to Natasha Brown now with CBS3. Hi, um, this question is just for uh, Mayor Kenny, just in reference to uh, Governor Wolf just a short time ago during his press conference. Um, saying that he will sign a bill allowing cocktails to go. And a lot of yeah. restaurants are happy about that, hoping that's going to at least give them some bit of a lifeline at this point. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? I think it's fine. I mean, uh, people were able to take wine out of a restaurant with, along with their food. And if they, you know, they want a, a jug, you know, half gallon of margaritas or Bloody Mary or something, it's, if it helps the bottom line for these struggling restaurants, then, then it's fine. As long as the people are 21 and over. Um, and um, I see no problem with it. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Natasha. We're <coughs> going to go now to um, Laura McChrystal of the Inquirer. Hi, um, a question for Dr. Farley about um, the testing of inmates in the city's prison system. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I think when it was announced that Montgomery County had done that testing, um, you know, beyond just the shortage of testing supplies, you had said, you know, that it wasn't clear that testing all of the people who don't have symptoms would have a real benefit. Um, so do you still feel that way? Could you explain, you know, what changed? Well, I would still say it's not clear that it's going to have a real benefit. We may find that uh, none of them are positive, um, and in which case we wouldn't do anything different. Uh, we may find someone who is testing positive who had the infection in the past, you know, that the test can stay positive for a long time, even after you recovered and not infectious. Um, I think we're going to learn with this. Um, this is an opportunity to see if we are missing a substantial number of cases that should be isolated that we're not already isolating. Um, you know, we're just taking the extra precaution now, but you know, whether it is it, gonna make a difference over the long term, um, we'll see. I, I do wanna emphasize again that it's not the test itself that, that prevents the spread of the virus. The virus doesn't care if you know where it is. It's only if that testing provides you information that can change your actions. Um, and the prison has taken some strong actions to prevent the spread, which appear to be working. Okay. Um, another question for Dr. Farley um, and some other places, I think, including in New York City, um, they've been releasing um, zip code data for um, reported deaths. Um, is that something that the city could do as well? We are careful to avoid um, presenting any small uh, data uh, amounts that could somehow uh, potentially identify a person. Um, and so in the past, the number of deaths by zip code was small enough to where uh, we couldn't really show much be meaningfully uh, within our data confidentiality rules. I'll look at that again and see though. 
Okay, um, thank you. And my final question um, would be probably for Brian Abernathy, if he's on, I'm not sure I've seen him on there today yet. Um, but any updates on what's going on at the airport with the folks who are sheltering there and efforts to get them moved? Uh, we're still planning to move forward on, on Friday. Uh, I think we've, we have identified um, beds for all the individuals there. We've coordinated with Delaware County. Their outreach team will also be on site. Uh, so I think operationally we're, we're in good to move forward. So it'll be specifically on Friday will be the day that action is taken or has it started already? Uh, so outreach is, is moving, uh, has been on site now, uh, and there, but um, certainly the, the majority of the action will happen on Friday. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Laura. We're going to go to um, Perla Laura now with Impacto. Can you hear me? Hola, Perla. Hola, ¿qué tal? Son dos preguntas rápidas. Uno, recibimos una denuncia justamente de una lectora de impacto sobre las condiciones preocupantes que eh, ella considera tiene su esposo que está encarcelado y porque tiene diabetes. Entonces, bueno, vamos a tratar eso en esta edición. Y la pregunta sería, ¿cómo están tratando... Um, Perla? Perla, I think you um, muted yourself. Yeah. Perla, no se te puede oír. Parece que ya has apagado el micrófono. Eh, ¿Me escuchaste? No, parece que apagaste el micrófono. ¿Cuál era es la... que me entró una llamada. Eh, entonces, eh, ¿en dónde te quedaste, perdón? No hiciste la pregunta. Ah, disculpa. Que eh, hay una eh, persona que hizo una denuncia eh, sí, 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 sí. en impacto que es esposa de un preso que está preocupada porque su esposo está enfermo de diabetes eh, y que también pues se suspendió su fecha de, eh, de corte, ¿no? Porque los tribunales están cerrados. ¿Qué le puede decir? a esta mujer que está en la situación de muchas otras personas familiares que están preocupados con eh, esos que están enfermos y que todavía no tienen una fecha para su corte. Okay. This is a question uh, that comes as a result of a complaint or a report from a reader of Impacto about a lady whose husband is in jail and he's unwell with diabetes. And she's concerned as well as many other people about court dates that are being postponed. <coughs> Her and other people in terms of dates, court dates that are not being scheduled. I'll do my best to answer that. Um, you know, we are working with the courts on expedited hearings, uh, and we understand that the courts will uh, have opened a number of, of courtrooms to hear expedited hearings. Um, the public defenders and the district attorney's office have worked together uh, to bring petitions uh, before the courts. Um, but uh, again, uh, I think that we are doing everything we can with the courts, but the judge, a judge has to have to has to make that final decision. Yeah. Brian y nos dice de que hemos estado en contacto con los tribunales para poder hacer eh, que se programen audiencias expeditas y se han abierto un número de salas para poder hacerlas y conjuntamente con la Defensoría Pública y la Fiscalía de la Ciudad se han hecho peticiones ante los tribunales para poder hacer esto. Pero es todo lo que nosotros podemos hacer porque finalmente esto depende de la voluntad y la decisión de los jueces. Mi segunda pregunta es, es sobre las elecciones que se acercan y que el 26 de mayo es el último día para pedir la boleta, que sabemos que se redujeron los lugares en donde se va a poder hacer el voto presencial el 2 de junio. Y bueno, ¿qué, qué piensan en general y cuál es el llamado? ¿Por qué tendrían que salir a votar, sobre todo la comunidad hispana, en estas votaciones primarias? ¿Qué piensan hacer en qué respecto, Perla? Sí, um, para motivar el voto. Okay, gracias. 
Uh, the second question has to do with the elections. Obviously, the May 26 is the deadline to request ballots. And Carla would like to know what is being done, what will be done to get people out to vote. We know that voting in person will take place on June the 2nd. Why should people go out to vote and what is the city doing to pass this message on to them? First of all, I think people should vote by mail. That's the most effective and the safest health-wise uh, way to do it. Um, getting, we'll, we're, we're, we'll ask people to come out there. The, the campaigns that are, people are running, are, I get mail in my mailbox every day. Uh, so people are after doing relatively active campaigns. They can't go door to door or go to public meetings. There's a lot of mail that's out there. City commissioners have been working uh, with uh, organizations and groups uh, to, uh, to inform people as to uh, where the polling places, there's gonna be a limited number of polling places. So we have to make sure we direct people to the right polling places and also insist and, or you know, uh, make sure they understand that they have to take these precautions with masks and social distancing and people should vote because it's their responsibility as a citizen to vote. Um, and um, it's a shame that people don't take that responsibility seriously. Uh, or frequently, uh, but it's ultimately up to people who are eligible to vote to actually do it either by mail or in person. Nosotros obviamente enfatizamos que es posible y es recomendable votar por correo. Nosotros pensamos que es la forma más eficaz y más segura de poder hacerlo, ya que la gente no puede estar saliendo como podía salir antes. Y obviamente las campañas se están llevando a través del correo, porque vemos que hay campañas que se están haciendo muy activamente en cuanto a lo que recibe uno en su correo diariamente, porque no hay reuniones grupales en reuniones públicas ni tampoco se puede ir tocando puerta a puerta como antes. Hemos trabajado y estamos trabajando con los comisionados porque hay un número limitado de lugares donde se puede efectuar el voto para que la gente comprenda de que si se va a utilizar el distanciamiento social, el uso de las mascarillas, porque finalmente es un ejercicio de su responsabilidad. La gente tiene que entender de que es importante votar, y tienen que hacerlo y debieran hacerlo más frequently. Gracias. He's muted again. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Perla. We are going to go to Julie Hancher now of Green Philly. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier about how residents should be wearing masks in parks. Um, I was curious if there is an official recommendation or guidelines as far as when residents are outside, um, such as using streets while running, biking, hiking, et cetera. Um, is there an official recommendation or what's the current um, guidelines around that? So there are um, guidelines we have, I believe, on our website uh, about uh, using mastering exercise. Uh, I know it's tough to actually be exercising with a mask on. It's tough to breathe, uh, but uh, there for people who are exercising, there's a recommendation that they people wear a gaiter or a scarf that they can, when they go by other people, put it up. Uh, and when they're more than six feet away from people, then they don't have to have it up. I think you know, when people are walking around, though, doing errands downtown, that sort of thing, the best thing is just to wear a mask at all times because it's, there's no reason not to. You can breathe just fine. Uh, and you never know when you might be passing somebody. Thank you. I just have one follow-up question. If someone is outside their home, such as gardening or doing something else, um, do you still recommend wearing a mask outdoors in that case? You know, if they're in their backyard and not gonna come across anybody else, I wouldn't recommend that. I don't feel like people have to do that. It may just be easier to have that habit, always be wearing it. But certainly again, if you're just walking down the sidewalk, uh, the recommendation is you should wear it just because you never know when you're gonna pass somebody. And it helps keep the pollen out. <laughs> Two very good reasons. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. We are now going to go into our second round of questions with Jack Tomsick from Metro. Yes, I think this, this is for the Commissioner Corny. Uh, last month, uh, I believe you reported uh, an inmate who had died from the virus. Did, have any additional... Jack, can you repeat your question? You just cut out. I think he was asking if we've had any additional inmate deaths. No, we have not. Okay. Okay, thank you. And our final question will go to Martin Pratt of Philly YBN. Martin? Thank you. Uh, my question is for Dr. Farley, and uh, today's New York Times is an article about an app called the COVID-19 
COVID system study. I'm not sure if you've seen that. It was a study published on Monday in the Natural Medicine Journal. And it was talking about uh, an app that allows anybody to do contact tracing by self-reporting. How do you feel about those type of apps or that type of contribution from the residents of Philadelphia? Is it worth us uh, you know, giving up our information, obviously not our personal information, but our information about our health to this uh, particular app is being used here and also in the UK to do a large study. I think it's from the Massachusetts uh, Hospital of General Medicine. I did not see that particular article. Uh, I do know that there are apps being developed that will let someone know if their cell phone is near someone else's cell phone. Uh, it could be a, an adjunct to con traditional contact tracing if that feature is turned on uh, so that people, you know, it can pick up the fact that they're near another cell phone. Uh, we are still exploring whether there's value to that. Many people may not want to turn on that feature. And if no one turns it on, it's not good any, of any value. Um, and so it's, it's still unclear to us. I, in general, let me just say, um, technology may help our contract tracing efforts, but it cannot replace it. We're still gonna need to have humans involved talking to other humans and saying, the test is positive, tell me who you were near so that I can talk to those people. Uh, Follow-up question. There were currently right now is 6,091 users in, in Philadelphia, according to this app. Would you eventually be interested in using, getting access to the data and using it to help you in your contact tracing? Um, that number would not be enough to us to have it be meaningful. Uh, so I would want to know more about whether we could get it to a, a big enough fraction of the city for the data to be useful. Uh, I really just think it's too early to say about the value of those apps right now. Okay, thank you, that was it. Great, thanks Martin. And that does conclude our briefing today. We will see everyone back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Thank you.